Hi everybody, this is Terry from Bonsai Tree once again and today I've brought you out to my field growing area in Grabo uh, where I've got a bunch of my trees uh, in the ground and uh, today I would like to show you some of the techniques that I use, some of the uh, little tips and things that might be of use to you uh, with uh, field growing your, your own trees. Uh, whether it be in your backyard or out on a farm if you have access to it or a piece of land you can uh, really develop wonderful trunks so uh, come along and let me show you some of my trees that I'm developing over here one of the benefits to field growing is uh, is of course the rapid development of a trunk so when you have a plant like this pyracantha that's been seed grown uh, or this cotoneaster that I've grown from cuttings if you are wanting to develop a substantial uh, a trunk with a taper, a good taper in it or even if you're just wanting to increase the girth of the trunk and uh, give it a lot of uh, curves in it or place a lot of curves in it with wire or something and you want those curves to set the fastest way to do that would be to put the plants into the ground um, because there's really no substitute for planting in, in the ground. Um, that's when you'll experience the, the most plant growth. Uh, the second prize would be a wooden box um, and uh, the slowest method would of course be putting it directly into a bonsai pot. So I'm going to show you how you can plant uh, plants like this in the ground. So before you put the tree into the ground this Pyracantha is a very long um, straight uh, tree at the moment and so I'm going to use some wire and to put some pretty drastic bends into the plant and uh, then when we, we plant it in the ground and then as it develops it'll obviously it will grow in that shape it's not too important how, uh, what the curves look like but you do want to give it uh, a lot of shape um, and you're going to exaggerate the curves that you put into the into the bends because as the trunk thickens obviously those bends will soften. So when you're ready to plant your tree um, and you've prepared an area that is uh, that you can grow these trees on for a couple of years um, then uh, there's, there's essentially two ways uh, that you can plant the tree into the ground. The one is if you plant it onto a tile uh, and I'll show you some trees that I've done in that manner um, if you pl put the seedling or the plant the young plant onto a tile that forces the roots to grow in a more horizontal fashion um, which uh, gives you a better sort of buttress uh, a flare at the base of the trunk or otherwise just plant it straight into the ground um, it's really dependent on the type of uh, style that you're going with uh, for your tree but anyway so this one really just uh, dig a hole um, if you're going to, you can use, uh, uh, depending on your soil, um, you can add uh, compost or whatever other organic material um, to just in, enrich the soil if you need to. Um, and then uh, plant your tree. And make sure that the, the height of the planting is... Uh, not um, is, 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 is as deep or as shallow as the existing uh, height of the of the plant um, so you don't want to bury it and uh, you of course I also don't want to have it sitting out too much out of the soil and uh, at this point you can just water it and um, care for it like any other plant in the ground uh, obviously the care for a pl plant uh, a plant that's planted into the ground or the field um, is going to be far less maintenance of course than a bonsai tree that's in a very defined uh, constrained uh, container where it's totally reliant on you to give it uh, the nourishment the water the fertilizer that it needs but it's uh, when it's in the ground uh, literally it's just uh, water uh, occasional watering and uh, fertilizing that you would need to provide it with so this is a Celtus chinensis or a Chinese hackberry um, that I planted a number of years ago on a tile and as you can see the result is that the base flares out as um, as the roots were forced to grow horizontally instead of straight down obviously the tendency is for them to grow straight down so um, you get a much more spreading buttress of roots 
One of the questions that I'm asked a lot is how uh, do you, how long do you grow, grow the tree for before you make that first cut? And uh, although I think I've got it figured out, I'm, I'm not 100% certain exactly when the best time is, but it's usually around when the trunk is about as thick as you would like it to be. Uh, because once you make that first trunk chop, there will be in successive growth, there will be some uh, increase to the, to the girth of the trunk, but it won't be as much as that original growth would have been before you, you cut it. Um, so the best is to allow the trunk to develop for as long as you, uh, it, you keep allowing the, the trunk to develop until it reaches the thickness that you want and then you make the first uh, trunk chop. Another of the questions that I'm often asked is when to make your cut. Uh, it depends on the species of the tree, but in this case uh, with Celtus chinensis, um, the best time to make your trunk chop if you're wanting back budding, which is obviously what you're wanting to get, um, is in the late part of spring, early summer, when the spring leaves have hardened off and uh, the tree is now full of energy once again and uh, you can then prune make your cuts and uh, then you will you should get a lot of back budding um, the same goes for chinese maples in fact because if you prune them in the uh, uh, say in the very very early part of spring uh, you're going to find or I find that it bleeds a lot and uh, that sap is essentially lost energy So it's better to prune in the latter part of the spring or early summer. So in this particular uh, tree yeah, um, I've um, I've made that cut uh, probably two years ago, maybe uh, latter part of spring as I mentioned and uh, made the cut straight across as i said it doesn't really matter what angle you make it because you're going to allow the tree to establish a new sap flow and you also obviously don't know where the new buds are going to form now you, you might have an idea but you're not going to know exactly where they are so cut uh, the trunk more or less where you uh, feel it should uh, where you want it to be uh, use a nice uh, coarse sharp saw and um, seal it and then um, this was done as I said two years ago probably and then these all these shoots would have then um, started to develop so I've allowed them to develop for the past uh, well at least a year um, of growth and now this is uh, spring and now I can I can remove there's there's three shoots here uh, that's going to be too many because if I allow these to develop it's going to create another big scar um, so it's better to remove, um, to just keep one. And this is more or less the front of the tree that you're looking at. Um, so I'm going to keep the front one, um, this one here. I'm going to keep this and I'm going to remove the other two. Um, we always want to try and keep scars uh, away from visibility. Obviously the first prize is to get them to heal. Um, but uh, whenever making cuts, try to cut uh, behind um, or cut to the back so that one doesn't see the scars. So here we have a Chinese maple that's been growing in the ground for a number of years and um, as you can see it's developed quite a nice thick trunk and I've decided that at this point I would like to cut it and start uh, developing a new trunk line uh, from a new leader. So I'm going to use a uh, saw, sharp saw and as I said to you before um, the angle of the cut is not of any consequence at this point in time. So we're just going to cut it straight across. Now you do need to be aware of the fact that the tree is going to shoot at dormant buds only. So you have to be careful not to cut it too low. Um, because otherwise there might not be any back budding. Um, and then secondly, don't cut it too high. Because if you cut it too high, you might uh, your new trunk line might develop or the new buds that develop for the new trunk line might be too high so you need to imagine you do need to be to some extent designing the tree while it's still in the ground so that you understand where to cut the tree where to cut the trunk so i'm going to be cutting it at around this point i know that there are that you can't see it on the camera but there are shoots behind the trunk uh, and it stands to reason that there would be other buds dormant buds lower down on the trunk in other positions as well so i'm going to cut it across and then i'm going to seal it and then 
we wait for new buds to develop and then those buds will be allowed to develop over the next season or two to become strong enough. Uh, the new sap flow will become quite evident and then I will carve the tree again, carve the cut and seal it again. I'm just going to seal the cut with a good sealer, in this case Top Gin sealer. It's my sealer of choice. Uh, applying it with a brush, it's a lot easier. And then just uh, when you're finished you can rinse the brush off and then reuse it. And let's just make sure that the tree is not going to get infected or attacked by anything. And it also just protects the exposed wood as well. Something else that the books also say is that when you make the cut um, to, to cut it at an angle, um, 45 degree or, or 60 degree angle, um, and then uh, shape that cut very nicely and seal it and everything, um, I've found in fact that it actually doesn't really matter because it, what angle you cut that tree at and, and shaping it is really much of a waste of time. So I just cut my trunk uh, flat uh, or pretty much any angle, whatever is most convenient, and then uh, do seal it and then allow the, um, the tree's natural dieback uh, to occur until it establishes a new sap flow. And as you can see, yeah, there's actually a, um, there is a line here yeah, that has been, that clearly denotes where this, um, where it's died back to. And then in, uh, and now obviously with this tree, um, I will develop one of these side branches as, uh, as being a new leader or new trunk line in this, in this area. Um, but this obviously contributed hugely to the, to the girth of the tree and will form part of the future structure of the tree. So here again, we see um, this trunk chop was made um, and then you can see how the um, sap flow has died back uh, down to these uh, to to these shoots that developed and now are becoming branches. Uh, so now it's safe once once that's visible. It's it's and you've got strong enough uh, growth to cut back to. You can now go back and shape this cut as well from the original trunk chop. And uh, I'm going to do that now. So I'm going. I want a little bit of an angle. Um, yeah, I don't want it to be very flat. So I'm going to use a saw to cut a diagonal down to and keep this branch. So this is going to be removed. And then I'll shape that cut and seal it. When you get to the end of the cut, always go a little bit very slow so that you don't damage the branch that you're cutting back to. And now you can go back with your uh, knob cutter and uh, while the wood is still wet you can go and just shape it slightly. Because this is a big cut, I'm uh, using a gouge chisel and a mallet just to round, uh, create that uh, concave uh, finish that we're looking for. Uh, obviously because the tree is in the ground it's nice and firmly anchored so it's not going anywhere. So the knocking with the, with the chisel and the, the mallet is not going to do any damage to it. And then once again, we're just going to seal it well. A lot of people, uh, well, quite a number of people anyway, uh, that I speak to seem not to bother with sealing. Um, uh, they say it doesn't really mat matter. Personally, I think uh, it, it, it can only help and uh, can only protect it protects the tree as well from from infection, um, bacterial infection or other 
and uh, and it helps to keep the callus mo the callus tissue moist. If it dries out, then the callus doesn't roll over the cut; uh, it won't heal. And uh, so it's very important that the sealer that you use um, it does keep it sealed. Um, so this m makes a very, quite a hard, watertight um, seal over the, the cut edges. One of the realities of field growing is that if you're going to allow big branches to develop, you're going to get very big scars when you cut. And this is particularly the case with uh, some trees that have difficulty in healing, so, uh, like your celtus, for instance. But things like maples heal over very quickly. So yeah, you can see these large cut areas that are still in the process of healing. But now you could use a branch like this in order to, as it fattens up and there is sap movement or sap flow into this area, this callus will spread and then... Um, full uh, slowly close this this area the alternative is to uh, not um, allow the branches to become too big um, before cutting them this is a good example of a large or what what was once a large cut scar that is largely healed over and uh, probably within one uh, maximum two seasons uh, there would be no evidence that there was a trunk chop at that point in contrast to the previous uh, scar that I showed you, um, you can see this area has still got a long ways to go before it will be healed over entirely. And you can notice on this uh, hackberry, the way that the callus forms is it's almost rolling over the scar. So if we were to fill this with something solid, uh, like a rock set or similar cement uh, solid structure because callus will never form over rotting wood. If we were able to fill this space up, um, the callus will not have to roll over as much and will rather spread over the surface, uh, thus healing large cuts uh, a little bit quicker. So the plan is to fill this space with a solid uh, with a rock set uh, cement based sealer or filler uh, but before I do that I'm just going to remove this old uh, sealant um, so that the filler has a solid base on which to, to anchor um, and I'm using a chisel to do this with uh, any tool suitable for the job is fine. Um, it's very important that uh, you understand that callus will not form over rotting wood. So whether you're going to fill it like I am or if you're just going to uh, um, activate the, the live edges again by scoring them, uh, if you have got um, heartwood that has been exposed and has started to rot. You need to clean that out, the rotted wood first, um, and seal that so that the callus can form onto that. Um, but as I said, I'm going to use a filler, which is not going to rot, um, and that's going to give the callus a sound uh, surface on which to, to, to form. And some trees this is not necessary on all trees, uh, but in my experience, the hackberries don't heal over large scars very easily. Uh, so it is a technique that I've been trying. And uh, so far, the results that I've seen are, are very impressive. It's certainly faster anyway than allowing the tree to heal uh, of its own accord. And I think large, the, the reason for this is largely as a result of the way that in particular hackberries heal on large scars where they form uh, a very thick callus which tends to roll over the, the cut area and when you've got very large scars like this one, 
it, it just take that, takes that much longer for the callus to be able to spread because it's first it's rolling over so the amount of material that has to build up here in order for that callus to firth, to move further over is quite considerable so you can see the girth of the new trunk line that is or leader that's growing up here in an effort to get this to heal over and it still hasn't healed over so by filling it the idea is that we raise this we raise this surface and then instead of the callus having to the callus has got to go somewhere so instead of it rolling over it's rather going to spread across and so that's what and i believe that's how how it works all right now i'm going to mix up some this is this is alkaline rapid set uh, anchoring patching cement uh, there is, uh, they didn't have rock set, but that's uh, essentially the equivalent, equivalent product. So you're going to scoop out enough of the powder, it's in a powdered form, uh, that, that should cover that area. As this one anchors in 15 minutes, uh, you need to work quite quickly. But you also, what's, you can use, uh, there are various epoxies that you can also use that'll, that'll work as well. Um, uh, and uh, that's, that, that'll generally be two parts. So you mix the two parts usually equally or something along those lines. Um, this is just mixed with water, which is, which is quite nice. Uh, the rapid, rapid uh, uh, um, set means that we can uh, mix it, apply it, and then uh, finish treating this area quite quickly uh, so we don't have to wait overnight or something. So not a, a standard cement and sand mix, it needs to be a, a rapid set type of thing. Rock set is also going to yield in a, a, a re relatively quick uh, space of time, probably about 15 minutes, maybe slightly longer. Um, Regardless, you don't want to use a sand and, and, and uh, cement mix because that's going to take a lot longer to, to heal. So you're going to mix to a smooth bit of a paste, you can see. It mustn't be too runny. If it's too runny, so if you add too much water to it, then uh, you're going to have a problem with uh, actually applying it. Um, and then you can just fill this up. This is probably going to be better to use something else to fill this with. And then um, as it, it's going to start healing and then we just need to make, or it's going to start setting rather. And then we just need to make sure that we are shaping it um, as we go along. So as you can see the cement filler has now dried and I've tidied up the edges. I've used a grafting knife to expose the green uh, live cambium and that is to <clears throat> sort of catalyze or initiate the, the healing callus formation process. And now I'm going to use top gin sealer on that edge to create a water and airtight seal because you want to keep it moist. Um, as long as it's moist, as long as the, ca uh, the cambium layer is moist at that edge, it will continue um, uh, callousing, it will continue spreading. So it's not important to seal the cement. Um, that's, you can just leave that uh, natural, um, but you need to seal all the edges that you've exposed and any areas that might have been damaged just to pr protect the tree from in any kind of infection. Uh, and then the callus will start forming over the growing season. As you can see, this old scar over here um, was filled, this area was filled with a cement and this has promoted the callus formation over this area and this cut, large cut is largely 
uh, been healed over. This is a old cut, uh, probably made at the same time as the earlier trunk chop. And uh, once again, you can see it was cut straight across. And um, now it's died back and uh, you can see the new branches started to, to develop nicely. <clears throat> so now I can go back and uh, actually prune uh, prune the cut, uh, shape the cut, so to speak, uh, better, so that uh, callus is promoted in a certain in a certain way. Obviously, you don't want it to be to be flat. Uh, when you're working with your tools, uh, like this knob cutter, uh, they are designed primarily for live wood, of course. So when you're making cuts on dead wood, you need to be a lot more gentle with the tool. Take smaller, smaller cuts, rather more frequent smaller cuts than to do large, large cuts, um, because that's most likely going to damage, damage the tool. <clears throat> so you just want to get the, uh, you just want to shape the cut, uh, ideally slightly uh, concave. Uh, which will help the callus to roll over the cut that you've um, that you've made, and then you can use uh, various sealers or fillers um, <clears throat> just to protect the exposed tissue and also help that callus to to, to heal over. Um, you don't want to you don't want it needs to be airtight because you don't want that callus to dry out. Um, it needs to be moist, kept moist at all times, so that it is um, likely to heal over. I'm now going to seal this cut uh, that I've made, <clears throat> and I'm going to use uh, Top Gin Sealer. Uh, it's a product that was actually recommended to me for, specifically for Celtis. Uh, I find them to be uh, it's very difficult to, to get large cuts to, to heal over and uh, this sealer was recommended to me and so far the results that I've been having uh, witnessing has is, is been very good. So just uh, sealing the whole, <clears throat> all the cut surfaces as well as the dead wood uh, just helps to prevent, uh, should help to prevent insects, borers and things from, from getting in. And this will uh, pr both protect the, the live wood, keep it moist, and uh, uh, will help to, to form the callus quickly. Uh, with regards to wiring in the field, um, one, it is, it is uh, something that you can do uh, to help uh, form your, your primary branch structure, the structural wiring, so to speak. Um, but you need to be I, because my growing areas are uh, fairly far away from where I live and I'm not able to get out here as often as I would like, um, I need to be very careful because especially if I'm wiring in the spring um, when there's uh, an explosive growth period, you can very easily uh, experience wire bite. Um, so you just need to be aware of that. Otherwise, uh, you can wiring um, at this point while the trees are still in the ground is a great idea. Here's a good example of wiring gone wrong. Um, this was a branch that uh, on a Chinese maple, which I wired last, uh, I guess it was in autumn, or maybe a little bit before. And uh, you can see how the wire has bitten into the, the branch. So these branches will probably have to be uh, probably have to be re rebuilt. When I first started field growing, what I would do is allow the tree, after being planted in the ground, to develop for a few years um, uncut. And then I would go back and dig the tree up from the ground and I would prune the roots back, uh, a total flat cut with a chainsaw, 
So I would start again with no roots, which is safe to do because the tree, when it's growing in a field, really develops uh, or builds up a tremendous amount of energy. So it's quite safe to do that. Although obviously I wouldn't suggest you do that with some species like your pot or any of the conifers, for instance. Um, and then I would also uh, a, a, um, a trunk, do a trunk chop, so cut the, the, the trunk back entirely. And then I would plant the tree back in the ground. Um, but I've since realized and learned um, that it's better just to leave the tree in the ground for the entire growing period so you don't actually uproot it at all. Um, you obviously will do your, your cuts as and when you need to, but you'll leave the tree in the ground. And this essentially means that, that you're not disturbing the root system of the tree. Because when you do that, uh, when you put the tree back into the ground, it takes at least a year for the tree to establish itself once again. And uh, so that's one year lost, largely lost, because the growth is minimal during that first, uh, first year. Uh, and the growth only then again picks up um, in the second year. So it's actually better just to leave the tree in the ground the whole time. And when you eventually do want to remove the tree, then you would, like in this, in this hackberry, I would ground layer it. So I would ring bark it as though I was going to do an air layering. And I would fill, back fill that uh, with uh, some good soil, uh, free draining soil, and encourage roots to form. And then after a season or so, I would then uh, remove the entire uh, trunk. So again, tree, cutting it as if it was an air layer and then it would be planted in its own container. Mm -hmm.